Hey guys, it's Game James, and guess what? I'm back! That's right, new office, new look, and a new game. Well, it's not exactly a new game, but I figured there would be no better time to cover it since Mario Tennis Aces for the Nintendo Switch just came out. That's right, we're taking a look at Mario Tennis for the Nintendo 64. This is not a game I personally have a lot of experience with. I've rarely played it and I just want to see how good the start of the Mario Tennis franchise really is. Let's start off with a simple singles exhibition match. While we're here, I'm going to go over the controls and how the game feels. Controls are as follows. A to hit the ball, and B to charge up a shot to hit the ball. Other than movement, that's pretty much it. And the movement is really crisp too. I never found a moment where I felt as if I couldn't control my character accurately. However, the gameplay is a bit on the boring side occasionally. Without many options for hitting the tennis ball, the game gets stale sometimes. This is rectified in another mode, but I'll get to that later. The character roster is pretty stacked. There are 20 playable characters all with their own unique stats, and they all come from different walks of the Mario universe. Since when has DK Jr. and Paratroop have been playable? I'm glad Mario Tennis Aces brought this kind of character selection back, with odd choices such as the blooper and the chain chomp. Stage selection is really nice as well, with 5 starter courts available when you launch the game, and a whopping 13 more courts ready to be unlocked. Each court also has its own ball speed and bounce height making for a different game on every court. Doubles is a bit harder than singles, but that's basically it. Adding two more players makes it harder to get the ball past the other team, but also makes it easier to keep the ball in the court. I wouldn't normally recommend this over singles. It's still fun, but play only if you're looking for a longer or harder game, or if you have over two players. Tournament is just singles, but in a tournament format. And wouldn't you know, I suck at Mario Tennis. I can't even win the easy tournament. I lost to Boo in the final round. I suppose tournament is a fine alternative to normal exhibition, but I'd stick to the other three modes in the game if you're looking for some real wacky fun. So what are the last three modes in the game? Well, they're more what you'd expect out of a Mario game. More random elements and more, as I said, wacky fun. Ring shot is admittedly the least interesting of the three modes. Most of it is hitting balls through rings. However, it can be pretty fun if you're in the right mood. Now it's time for the main show in my opinion, the Bowser stage. This is the one I would play when I occasionally picked up Mario Tennis. It has items and a tilting stage, making it the best mode in my opinion. This is what I really want when I want to play a Mario Tennis game. Items make for a much more fun game experience, and the tilting stage adds a new strategic element into the gameplay. The stage tilts with your movement, so if your character is standing on the left side of a court, the court will tilt to the left. Items are triggered with the Z button and have various effects. For example, the banana peel travels with the ball and places itself on the opponent's side of the court. It does what any Mario banana does, it trips you up. Red shells track you down and green shells fire in threes. Overall, it's very fun and the mode I definitely would play the most. Piranha Challenge is the last mode in which you have to hit balls coming from three piranha plants in rapid succession. Again, it's fun, but nowhere near the fun levels of Bowser's stage. Case in point, play Bowser stage if you're gonna play Mario Tennis. The other modes are fun and all, but like, you wanna play Bowser stage, trust me. In terms of giving this game a rating, I'll give it the stellar spin-off rating. The lack of variety in the exhibition mode is concerning, but the other modes make up for it really well, especially the Bowser stage. And the game controls really well. I'm glad I revisited the original Mario Tennis. It's a pretty good game. You know? Waluigi debuted in this game. Oh man. Rest in peace, Waluigi. <laughs> hey y'all, Game Chams is back. I hope you enjoyed this episode despite how short it was. I just wanted to get something out to you guys after such a long time. If you want to see more Game Chams, I have two more episodes right here. One on Final Fantasy, and one on ARMS. Check them out if you want, and I'll see you guys in the next episode. See ya! Hey guys, it's Game James, and it's no secret that I love Super Smash Bros. It's my favorite game series of all time. But what happens when a game takes only the competitive parts of Super Smash Bros. and makes its own game with it? This is Icon's Combat Arena. I have to clarify now that Icon's Combat Arena is in closed beta and will be releasing to the public soon. Any complaints that I have may be addressed in the future. I don't know. Due to the game being in closed beta, I'm going to try not to focus on the lack of content, but rather the content that is already there, and how fun it is to actually play. As of right now, there are 7 playable characters and 5 stages to choose from. 
However, there are no items and no stage hazards. Only the competitive side of Smash Bros made it into icons. So does this game hold up? Or does it completely flop? Let's find out. One thing I have to get out of the way is the amount of microtransactions in the game. Icons uses a gem currency to buy new fighters and skins, and as far as I know, there is no way to obtain this currency other than buying it with real money. It kinda sucks, honestly, to have to buy stuff. I would give a pass to the fighters being paid, but only three are available from the start. A measly three! That's barely anything. However, to mitigate this, you do start with 5,000 gems, and each fighter is 1,000 gems, so you can get all the current fighters and maybe a few skins on top. So that's nice. Overall, the microtransactions aren't very bad right now, but they have the potential to grow as an issue in the future. So, since there's not a lot of modes to cover in icons, I'm going to cover each fighter instead, starting at Ashani, a human engineer from Earth. A lot of people compare Ashani to Captain Falcon, and I can see the comparison. The movement is similar, and the Falcon Punch is present, although this time with a build-up meter. Other Ashani attacks include a ground discharge and an electric hook. Ashani is fun to play, but by no means completely original, and not a character I find myself playing often. Our next stop is Kid, a goat thing with guns and a jetpack. Again, there's a popular comparison with this character, this time being with Fox. And yet again, I can see the comparison. But this time, literally all four of Kid's special moves are ripped from Fox, with small variations here and there. It's a little disappointing, especially since I find Kid to be one of the most fun characters to play in Icons. Incredibly enjoyable if you can put aside the unoriginality. Raymer is a cool looking dude with guns. More guns, yay! Raymer's guns work a bit differently than Kid's, though. You can aim them wherever you want, which honestly works a lot better than you'd expect. Other than this, however, Raymer is one of the less enjoyable fighters in the game, at least in my opinion. He's nice, and I like the concept, but he's just not for me. I'm sure others will find him to be really fun, though. Zurong is Marth. Whereas Kid had some differences between him and his base Smash character, Zurong has almost none outside of a weak projectile. Pass on Zurong. She's the worst character in the game. Not by a competitive standpoint, but by a design standpoint. I really like these next three fighters, though. They tie the game together for me. They, along with Kid, are my favorites. They're really unique and really cool to play. Zana is a heavier character with a lot of melee attacks. Think Ganondorf, but a lot better. Her power is really cool to wield, and it's really interesting to be able to just run around and smack the hell out of whoever you want. That's one thing I really like in fighting games. All of the characters should be good competitively. Sure, some will be better than others, but all should be viable. Icons pulls this off almost perfectly. It wasn't a character I thought to be too overpowered or too awful. Second to last are Afi and Galu, a duo with elemental powers. You can switch between them every few seconds, almost like teleportation. Each one is different, however, not by a lot, but still different enough to change your playstyle when playing as either. I find the swapping mechanic really intriguing and unique, as with the character's movesets. Finally, there's the big man, my main, my boy, Weishan. He doesn't seem to have any kind of base smash character, and he's a heavyweight that excels at mid-range combat instead of close range. It works, and it's a ton of fun. Normally I mean lighter characters in fighting games, but I am making an exception for Weishan. I picked up the closed beta just because of him. He's just incredible. But enough about Weishan. I played a bit of online, and it works pretty well. I didn't run into any lag or anything like that. The game would supposedly be online focused, so good online support is a necessity. Let me comment on the stages really quickly. Some of them are really colorful and really bright, like Malu Malu or Forbidden Shrine, but some of them are really not colorful and not bright, like Cryo Station or Wave Dash Arena. It's really inconsistent, but they all function fine, I guess. I mean, they're meant to be competitive stages, but the graphics just disappoint sometimes. So what do I think about Icon's combat arena? I think it's just masterful. Yes, I know I've been complaining some about the graphics and the originality, but the graphics are tentative and the originality can be forgone if the game is fun, which Icon's really is. Play it next month, but don't mean you're wrong. Don't. You know, I've been hearing a lot about this other platform fighter for uh, Nintendo Switch, PS4, and PC. I can't remember the name of it though. On the tip of my tongue. Wait. <gasps> hey guys, thanks for watching yet another episode of Game Games. If you want to see more, I've got more. Super Smash Bros. Brawl and Mario Tennis. If you want to check those two videos out, I hope you enjoy them, and I will see you all soon with another episode. See ya! Hey guys, it's Game James, and I've been playing Brawl out for a while. But whenever I try to get someone to play Brawl out with me, they're always like, 
sprawl out. <laughs> so I'm making this video to describe to you how Brawl Out plays, feels, and what sets it apart from Super Smash Brothers. And yes, I know, this is my third platform fighter video, but I also don't care. So let's dive right in and see what Brawl Out really is. I'll be playing the Nintendo Switch version of the game, but note that Brawl Out is also available on PC and PS4. And immediately when booting up the game, you can kind of tell it's a PC game first. The menu design screams mouse and keyboard. I mean, it works, but it just doesn't feel like a Switch short of menu. Enough about the menu though, let's hop into the game. There are eight main playable characters and a lot of spin-off type characters with slightly different movesets and stats than the main characters they're based on. I won't be covering the spin-off characters, I see little point in doing so. What I will be talking about is the roster of eight that make up the primary fighting force in Brawl Out. Before we do that though, I want to talk about a mechanic called the Rage Meter. It builds up when you hit opponents or when you get hit. With it, you can stop yourself for a few seconds to stop combos or stop your momentum. But when it's fully charged, you can enter Rage Mode for approximately 20 seconds. Rage Mode ups your attack strength and nullifies any damage done to you, but Competitive Mode, which is an option in the settings, turns off the attack boost, which is nice for competitive players. Olaf Tyson is a duo. Olaf is the walrus looking guy and Tyson is the penguin. Olaf is the one you'll be attacking with though. Olaf is a heavy hitting character who can freeze opponents and create ice pillars. He can turn into a snowball and roll across the stage by pressing B while sprinting. He also has what's called a jab special, something I haven't seen in any other platform fighters. It's triggered by pressing B directly after a jab is performed. Overall, Olaf Tyson is a really interesting and unique character to play due to his distinct moveset and the addition of other mechanics. Sephira is a princess with the ability to create sinkholes in the ground. Opponents can get trapped in these sinkholes, allowing for many different attack strings to be performed. She can also use a jab special, like Olaf. Sephira plays like an odd mix of Sheik and Sonic, with a fast running speed and faster kicks. She's pretty fun to play as, but not one I play as too often, as her play style just isn't for me. King of Pooh is a monkey king with a whip arm? I think that's what it is anyways. Again, this character is a jab special. Note that not all of them do, some characters have different types of moves than others, which I find really cool. Apu can pull fighters in close with his whip to do massive damage with his jab or other melee attacks. I find Apu to be a little cheap sometimes, and he's admittedly my least favorite character to play. I just don't really enjoy him that much. Chief Feathers is an eagle who is honestly the least different character in the game. Almost all of his moves and stats seem to be copy-pasted from other fighters from other games, making him this weird mashup of moves and mechanics. However, despite this, I like Chief Feather's playstyle, and I still pick him sometimes. Just not that often, as I find other characters to be better. Paco is a really interesting frog wrestler thing. He's made exclusively of melee attacks and grapples. I find him incredibly fun to play as, and I especially like using his tongue recovery to latch onto opponents and ledges. Paco also has a move where you can pick up an opponent and carry them for a short time, which is pretty cool, seeing as you can carry them to the edge of a stage and proceed to edge guard them with a spiking forward air. Volt is my favorite and my main fighter. He's an electric hedgehog with shocking spines and the ability to summon lightning bolts. His ranged combat is perfect for me. I just have so much fun playing as Volt. Volt has a jab special and a unique aerial down special. These, along with his many other unique moves, make him my choice for the absolute best character in Brawl Out. Now we get into the two guest characters. These characters aren't inherently from Brawl Out. They're actually from other indie game franchises. I find it really cool that I can recognize some of these characters from other games. The Hyper Light Drifter is playable in Brawl Out. I want to address how everyone thinks the Drifter is overpowered, and to some extent he is. At least with beginning players. More knowledgeable players can easily counter the Drifter's attack, and he is low tier as a result of this. Besides his competitive value, the Drifter is really fun to play, sporting an energy sword that he uses for most of his attacks. He feels like a souped up sword wielding character with a lot of combo potential. I really like him. Finally, there's Juan from Guacamelee. He has no smash attacks. Instead, he relies on attacks from his core game. I've played a bit of Guacamelee, and I have to say Juan feels almost exactly like he does in there. He fits really well into the cast of Brawl Out 2. It feels like he was meant to be part of the game from the start. Juan is a really neat character all around, and I'm glad he's part of Brawl Out. Now that I've been singing the game's praises for a while, and now that I've talked over every main character, I want to address some issues I have with the game. They don't detract from it too much, but I feel like they're worth mentioning anyway. There are no grabs and no shields. It makes for a simpler fight, but... I feel like it takes away some of what made the Smash Core concept great in the first place. I would have at least liked some grabs, I can do without the shields, honestly. And the balancing is a little off sometimes. King of Pooh and Chief Feathers I find to be kind of overpowered, and characters like the Drifter never see competitive play. With only 8 characters, it kind of sucks that only some of them are viable. 
There's also a gem system here, like in Icons. However, I didn't mention it before because you can earn all the gems in-game and there's no actual microtransactions, so it's a lot better than Icons. I do still enjoy Brawlout quite a bit. It's a really cool game and I'm obviously giving it the rating of unique fun. I hope I convinced you to at least look further into the game, if not buy a copy of it outright. So do I prefer Icons or do I prefer Brawlout? That's kind of a hard question to answer since Icons is in closed beta, but I will have to say that I prefer Icons as a competitive game and Brawlout as a casual game, if that makes any sense. Now I guess there's only one question remaining. Do you want to have a bad time? Hey guys, thanks for making it to the end of the episode. I have more to show you. Icons, Combat Arena, and Mario Tennis. If you want, check this out, and I'll see you in the next episode. See ya! Nah, let's do WarioWare instead. Hey guys, welcome back to Game James. It's been over a year since I started this channel, and this is the 10th episode of Game James. So to commemorate the occasion, I'm going to play a game that has absolutely no relation to the channel whatsoever. And while it may not have any relation to the channel, it has a lot of relation to me personally. I used to write this game all the time back in the Blockbuster days. Rest in peace, Blockbuster. WarioWare Smooth Moves is one of the Wii's launch titles, and while it may have been largely overshadowed by Wii Sports, I believe WarioWare Smooth Moves is even better than Wii Sports. Why? Let me show you. WarioWare Smooth Moves has an admittedly strange concept for a story. Wario gets his food stolen by a mysterious small creature, which leads him to an even more mysterious temple. There, Wario is introduced to the Form Baton, which is actually a Wii Remote. This magical device allows the users to play a variety of minigames in a selection of forms, such as the Remote Control and the Umbrella. All that these forms serve to do is provide you with different ways to hold the Wii Remote, thus providing different ways to play. It's a really cool idea, actually. Two seconds after I'm holding the Wii Remote up to my nose like an elephant, I'm holding it to my hip like a samurai waiting to strike. And the minigames really take advantage of this, too. Gameplay between minigames is kept fresh through the use of forms. In the first stage, Wario's, only the remote control form is used, which is unfortunate, but I suppose it is necessary to expose new players to the use of quick minigames. Later stages start adding in more and more forms, making each stage harder than the last. Each minigame is unique, not only in its gameplay, but in its art style. It feels like every single minigame was designed and illustrated by a different person. It feels like the game itself has a consistent art style and the fact that it has no consistent art style. The only similar art can be seen in the menus and in the cutscenes, which there are plenty of. Cutscenes play before and after story mode stages, and they provide interesting looks into the weird and wacky world of WarioWare. The cast of the game is just as weird too. My favorite, excluding Wario himself, is Ashley, the brooding witch who just happens to have a pet devil. She also appears as an assist trophy in Super Smash Bros. Wii U, 3DS, and Ultimate. Huh. After a certain amount of minigames are cleared in each stage, you are then presented with a boss minigame. These are longer games designed to challenge and engage the player in unique ways, reflecting the game as a whole. They are also very different from each other. In one, you may be driving a car to the end of the road while avoiding wildlife in the forest surrounding you. In another, you may be waiting for your topping bun to a burger to arrive, all while miscellaneous objects are placed on your burger. The story is short. You can clear it in about an hour if you know what you're doing. But the unlockables and the replay value is where this game really shines. You'll find it really difficult to unlock everything in the game, as some of the unlockables are really hard to obtain. <clears throat> My favorite side event would be Dr. Krygor's stage, which isn't the story stage. In Dr. Krygor's stage, the player is challenged with burning as many calories as possible, which basically amounts to a high score at the end based on how many calories you burn. This is my favorite because it's short but has a lot of value due to the randomization of minigames from all of the main story quests. Another interesting thing I forgot to mention is 9 volts minigames. All of them are themed around Nintendo titles preceding WarioWare Smooth Moves, making them incredibly fun to play through. Seeing older Nintendo games in a different light and style of play, especially with most control added, is a nice touch to an already nice experience. There's also a multiplayer section where you can find cool twists on the single player campaign minigames. This is where I spent a lot of time as a kid, playing these modes with my brother. With all the praise, I do have one problem with this game. The motion controls can sometimes be a bit wonky. However, it works like 98% of the time and the Wii Motion Plus wasn't even out at this time, so I'm gonna give it a pass. In summary, WarioWare Smooth Moves gets the rating of Smooth Sailing. Whether you have a bunch of friends over, or you're alone in your basement without friends, 
Wario Rush Smooth Moves is the game for you. The replay value is high, the stylistic decisions are great, and the mini games are really, really fun. Alright, that about wraps it up for today's Game James episode. I hope you enjoyed and. Hello? Uh... Hey guys, it's Game James, and thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to watch other videos of mine, check the description for links to my videos on Brawlout and Icons Combat Arena. I'll see you guys next time. Bye! Today, I wanted to cover something that I've been wanting to cover for a long time now, but didn't really see an opportunity to do so as it didn't fit the traditional Game James video mold. Today, I wanted to cover some consoles that Atari may have planned and even put into production, but were cancelled and never saw the light of day. There's a surprising number of them too. Before Atari dropped out of the console market, they took a see what sticks approach to console manufacturing and threw a bunch of ideas and concepts at the wall and sometimes they didn't really work out. Today, we'll be looking at some of those consoles that didn't work out. So, let's take a look back to the past and check out some of Atari's cancelled consoles. We'll start with a simple improvement to the classic and well-known Atari 2600, the Atari 2700. It was one of several planned successors to the 2600, but it was never officially put into production. It utilized wireless controllers and was to be backwards compatible with 2600 games and controllers. The case of the consoles took a departure from previous Atari hardware and used a sleeker, wedge-like design. The high-tech wireless controllers were impressive for the time, but they ended up being the console's downfall. They used radio technology, but had no specific frequency aimed at the console, allowing controllers to interact with other Atari 2700s up to a thousand feet away, as well as potentially other household radio-operated equipment such as garage doors. However, the Atari 2700 did leave a lasting legacy in the world of Atari. Its case design in particular inspired cases for the Atari 2600 Junior and the Atari 5200, which both saw releases in the console market. The 2700 does exist, and can be seen in museums as well as in the hands of collectors. The Atari Panther was the planned successor to the Atari 7800. It housed a 32-bit processor inside an odd, spaceship-looking case. I actually kind of like the design of the system. However, the console was abandoned as another Atari console producer had made significant progress on the Atari Jaguar, a 64-bit console, which Atari thought would sell much better. Three games were planned for the launch of the Panther in 1991, being Cybermorph, Raiden, and Trevor McFur in the Crescent Galaxy. All of these games were later remade for the Atari Jaguar. No prototype has surfaced for the Atari Panther, and it is thought not to exist. Atari wanted to delve into the handheld video game market long before they released the Atari Lynx. Before the ill-fated Lynx was supposed to be the Atari Cosmos, a tabletop system set to release around 1982. It utilized holographic technology, which basically amounted to two LED displays superimposed on top of each other. The Cosmos was to support two players, and power from an AC adapter rather than batteries, tying the console to an electrical outlet. The Atari Cosmos was heavily criticized at trade shows, and Atari may have seen it as too much of a risk to release the console officially. However, despite this, many models of the Cosmos exist, box and all. The Cosmos was so close to release, in fact, that advertising had already begun for the console and pre-orders were placed. The Atari Sierra was an interesting idea for hardware that never actually made it into production. Only one image of the design is known to exist. There was to be a 16 or 32-bit computer processor inside, so it's not exactly a console, but I'm choosing to include it anyway. There were many versions of this hardware being developed, but all progress was stopped when Jack Tremail bought Atari and shut down several research teams in order to cut costs. Another cancelled effort from Atari was the Atari Game Brain, a dedicated Pong console. The Game Brain would have played several variations of the game Pong, as well as other Atari home video hits such as Stunt Cycle and Video Pinball. It featured built-in control setups and was to really be released in 1978. The system was actually developed to clear out excess CPU units from their other dedicated gaming systems. However, by the time the Game Brain was finished, the Atari 2600, as well as other cartridge-based hardware, had been released. Dedicated Pong systems were becoming old news, and Atari sought to focus on the 2600 instead of the aging hardware presented by the Game Brain. Units of the Game Brain do exist, with a few ending up in museums. There was a precursor to the 2600 planned, or rather an earlier model to the system we know today. It's commonly referred to as the Atari 2500, and its design is very interesting. It had built-in joysticks, the same ones from the Atari 2700, as well as buttons above them, but the 2500 also had controller ports akin to the 2600s. 
It functions the exact same as a normal Atari 2600, but it's an interesting look into the original ideas for the Atari 2600. A model of the Atari 2500 exists at the Atari Museum. I've saved the best two concepts for last. One is the Atari Jaguar Duo, a console that was to play both Jaguar cartridge and Jaguar CD games. However, due to Atari's struggle to compete in the console market, and the botched launch of the Atari Jaguar that possibly led to millions of lost sales, the console was never released. There was a small run of cases run for the machine, and they have surfaced in many places. The Jaguar Duo featured a strange disc slash cartridge tray that looked like a black shield, and a big red button that I assume was to power the console. I'm also making the assumption that it used the same controllers as the Atari Jaguar. Finally, we have what is only known as the Atari Mirai. There is nothing known for sure about this console, other than the one case that has surfaced at a museum. Theories for the console include an American localization of SNK's Neo Geo, or an original 8, 16, or even 32-bit console. It features six multicolored buttons on the front as well as a large cartridge slot. However, nobody from Atari has made an official comment regarding what the Atari Mirai is or was supposed to be. It's one of gaming's great mysteries that will most likely be lost to time. I hope you all enjoyed this short glance over our shoulders at what could have been in the console industry. Gaming history is one of my favorite topics to study, as there's so many companies and projects and ideas that there could be days and days of videos about them. And if you ever want me to talk more gaming history, let me know. I'd like to make more of these videos. Maybe I could cover another gaming company in the future. Hey guys, it's Game James, and I hope you enjoyed my little deviation from my traditional video format. If you'd like to see more of me, I have Super Mario Bros. vs. The Legend of Zelda, as well as WarioWare Smooth Moves. Click on those if you'd like, and I'll see you all next time. Bye! Hey guys, it's Game James, and wow does it feel like I've been waiting for this movie for forever! Detective Pikachu is finally out, and I saw it with a bunch of friends, and... Ah! Okay, let me explain. I know I normally don't do movie videos on this channel, but since this is a video game movie, I figured I could get away with it. I just saw it at my local theater, and I really wanted to do a video on it. Minor spoilers ahead, though. I won't reveal any of the endings or twists or anything like that. I'm just going to cover a couple of specific scenes and tell you whether they're good or bad. So, without further ado, let's talk about Pokemon Detective Pikachu. I'm first going to cover the Pokemon designs, as I'm sure that's what everyone wanted to first see from Detective Pikachu. They looked really good, they were detailed, and the CGI was great at most points in the film. There were a few hiccups here and there, but it was perfectly acceptable and I saw them as part of the world around them. Ranging off of that, I believe that they fit a good majority of the time into their environments. However, the Pokemon did use rather drab color palettes, which I think was the right decision, but it caused them to occasionally stick out in scenes with bright colors and contrast. Overall, it didn't feel out of place to have these Pokemon walking next to people in a real world setting. Ryan Reynolds voicing Pikachu was absolutely amazing. His voice works fit the design and the character of Pikachu perfectly. He was a much better choice than Danny DeVito. You can fight me on that if you really want to. While I did love Reynolds in his role, most of the other acting was sometimes questionable. Justice Smith as the lead character, Tim Goodman, seemed to be a great choice a lot of the time, but he did stick out as a bit dry, especially in certain scenes. I don't want to say he is a bad actor. Justice Smith is an amazing actor, and has been in hit movies like Jurassic World, Fallen Kingdom, and Paper Towns. I just don't know if he was the right option for the role. The same would go for the character of Lucy Stevens, played by Catherine Newton. The writing was a bit awkward at times as well. One specific scene I remember being a bit confusing was when Lucy first meets Tim in an apartment building where Tim's father used to live. Lucy went on a big monologue about Tim and his father, and it was really cheesy. I was waiting for a punchline, but it never happened. I figured after the scene the audience was just to take the line of normal speech. I'll give a brief synopsis of the story for the first 20 minutes or so. No real spoilers, but if you don't want to hear it, please skip ahead. Researchers at a lab firm are working on a genetic experiment, which breaks loose and supposedly causes a car crash involving Tim's father. Tim meets Detective Pikachu at his dad's apartment in Rhyme City, which is filled to the brim with people and Pokemon living together. After being convinced his father is alive by Detective Pikachu, who can only talk to Tim, Tim and Pikachu go on a journey to find his dad and solve the mystery of his disappearance. One decision I love about Detective Pikachu is that they didn't try to explain Pokemon to the viewers. They let the world explain the Pokemon, not the other way around. I always felt like a big thing in video game movies that was a problem was that they always tried to explain everything to new viewers. Letting the story explain things 
really helped Detective Pikachu in my eyes. Legendary and Warner Brothers decided to keep the story simple, probably for two reasons. One, kids are the target audience. Two, going for an overcomplicated and complex story may have ruined the movie and taken away from the joy of seeing realistic Pokemon in a real world setting. This was the right decision in my opinion. One con, however, was that I saw some, if not all of the twists, coming a mile away. Again, this movie is aimed at children, so I won't complain too much, but it did strike me as a bit off-putting. My final complaint comes from a scene that shouldn't have existed in the first place. Minor spoilers ahead. At one point in the film, Tim and Lucy enter a field where the ground starts moving. And by moving, I mean chunks of it rise and fall as the main characters rush to survive. In the end, they just end up being giant Torterra, and that's all we hear of it. It just seemed like an excuse to hurt Pikachu to set up a meeting with Mewtwo. It felt forced, and I feel like they could have somehow written it, that in, or explained the whole situation better. Okay, I can't hold it in any longer. I loved seeing this movie. I was amazed seeing some of my favorite Pokemon on the silver screen in realistic fashion, and I'm still amazed. I'd say if you're looking to see Detective Pikachu, I'd definitely recommend it. I'll give it the rating of best video game movie. It certainly deserves it after seeing stuff like Rampage and Tomb Raider. Also, Legendary's already working on a sequel, and I'm so ready for it. Ah! Hey guys, thanks for sticking with me until the end of the video. If you enjoyed, I have a couple of other videos to share. Atari's canceled consoles and Pokemon Snap. Thanks again, and I'll see you all next time. Bye. What is there even left to say about Sonic the Hedgehog? He starred in mediocre game after mediocre game, ex excluding Sonic Mania, and now he's getting a movie, and... While we wait for the 2020 release date of Sonic's movie, let's look at an actually good Sonic game from 2010, Sonic Colors for the Wii. I don't have fond memories of this game, but I have seen reviews and most of them are kind to it. So let's take a look at Sonic Colors and I'll give you my take on the game. First, let's talk about some basic story. Dr. Eggman is opening an amusement park made up of five planets. In Sonic and Tails' visit to foil an evil plan they don't even know exists. Eggman is secretly collecting alien energy to mind control everyone on Sonic's world. And Sonic now has to save the aliens, called Wisps, and stop Eggman. I won't go into more than that, just in case you don't want spoilers, from a game that released 9 years ago. This game belongs in the Boost Formula class of Sonic titles, which basically amounts to modern Sonic. A lot of people don't really like it too much. I'm kind of indifferent. It can be good and bad. However, this is kind of where the Boost Formula really hits its stride. This is a good game in my opinion. Not the greatest Sonic game, nor that exceptional of a game, but it exceeds Sonic standards and that's gotta be worth something, right? The story is told through cutscenes and, unlike most Sonic cutscenes, these aren't unbearable. I even found myself laughing at a couple of the jokes. Sonic is still filled with that classic attitude he's known for, but it's more channeled and isn't very annoying. The visuals are amazing in this game. Though somewhat limited by the hardware, Sonic Colors is still one of the prettier games I've encountered on the Wii. Graphical work is great, and the amusement park vibe is evident in most of the worlds. The amusement park seems to be an excuse to throw different themes of worlds at you, while all of them fit well into the park's look. My favorite section, at least visually, was the opening world. It just felt like a big Eggman-created metropolis, kind of like Springyard Zone from Sonic 1, but with flashing lights and a lot of colors. See what I did there? Speaking of worlds, there are six to choose from, the main starting hub, and five planets. All of them feel wildly different from each other, and feature new powers to use and new gameplay elements. These powers are activated by the Wisps, the aliens that inhabit these worlds. One burrows into the ground, one acts as a rocket, launching you high into the sky, and one turns certain rings into platforms you can jump on. There's eight colors of Wisps in total, and they all provide unique abilities that spice up the gameplay from level to level. The levels are very short, most can be beaten in two to five minutes, but this isn't really a bad thing. Each new concept is given time to develop in these miniature stages, and then can be used later down the line. And the level design is excellent. Speedy sections are balanced almost perfectly with platforming, destroying enemies, and using powers. It's fair most of the time. Emphasis on most of the time. 
Yes, sometimes the controls in Sonic Colors can be a bit aggravating. Sometimes it feels like I press the A button right at a ledge and I just don't jump. Sometimes I can't stop in time and Sonic goes careening off the edge of a platform. It can be a little irritating, but it doesn't ruin the game completely. The gameplay switches from 2D to 3D on a number of occasions. I found myself having fun in both gameplay styles, which was not really the case for many other 3D Sonic titles. There is an element of collecting as well. Red rings can be grabbed in every level, and they unlock levels in the co-op mode. Did I mention the co-op mode yet? Well, good thing I didn't, because it ain't much. Co-op in Sonic Colors is a bit of a mess. One screen for two Sonics doesn't really work out, as one player going too far ahead will kill their partner. Thankfully, these levels can be played in single player. Later levels in Sonic Colors can also be a bit frustrating. They sometimes use a sort of trial and error design philosophy, which isn't very fun and leads to a lot of unnecessary deaths. Back to the positives. The music is great and had me tapping my feet on multiple occasions. Fun fact, I'm actually listening to the game's theme song, Reach for the Stars, as I'm writing this sentence. I had the most fun using a GameCube controller, but the Wii Remote, Nunchuck, and Classic controller are all options. It's very possible I'm holding favorites because I love the GameCube controller, so keep in mind that all of the controllers, outside of maybe the solitary Wii Remote, are decent picks. The game is pretty short. You can beat it in about a day if you're dedicated. But that isn't too bad of a thing, considering there are better ranks to get in each stage. Unless you get S rank in every single stage in your first try, which basically means you put way too much effort and time into Sonic Colors. As a Sonic fan who had never even touched Sonic Colors before this video's production, I did like Sonic Colors. It's not my favorite Sonic game. That award goes to Sonic 2 or Sonic Rush. Don't, don't judge me, please. But it does rank pretty high on my list. Its amazing visuals and usually tight controlled gameplay keeps me from saying that this is just another bad Sonic game. Too bad it came out nine years ago and... Hey all, Game James here. Thanks for watching my Sonic Colors video. If you'd like to see more, I've got more for you. Pokemon Detective Pikachu and Atari's Cancelled Consoles. I hope to see you soon. Bye. Hey guys, it's Game James and I cannot believe what I'm getting myself into. Nintendo Switch Online is universally hated. Nobody really likes it. But one benefit that I think gets overlooked a lot is the NES games you get when you subscribe. There's a lot of games you get with an NSO subscription, with 20 that were available at the September 2018 launch of the service. I'm going to go over all 20 of them and see if the NES online service was worth it at launch. This will not include any games that came to the service after September 2018. This is only for the original titles that debuted with the service. Let's start our adventure with Balloon Fight. I hope I don't have to explain Balloon Fight in detail to you. Basically, you float around and pop balloons. Balloon Fight is kind of a welcome inclusion. It can sometimes be a classic and sometimes it's just very simple. It reeks of early NES, and you'll see this trend later in the list. Baseball is awful. It just feels like a souped up Atari 2600 game. It's incredibly slow and not very fun to play. Also, another theme you'll notice in the near future is sports games. Ugh. This game needs to go lie down. It belongs nowhere near this collection. Now here's an instantly recognizable name. Donkey Kong. Everybody knows Donkey Kong. Everybody's played Donkey Kong. It's an absolute classic and certainly needs to be on a collection of classic NES titles such as this. While its gameplay may not always hold up to NES standards, I can't really imagine this service without it. Double Dragon is a great game, but I'm a little surprised they didn't go with a later, possibly better entry in the series. That being said, Double Dragon and its sequels are staples of the Nintendo Entertainment System's library. They are, in my opinion, the premier beat-em-up games for the console. Another solid inclusion. Dr. Mario is great puzzle fun. I used to play it all the time with my family when we first got an NES clone system with the cartridge included. In the absence of Tetris, possibly due to licensing issues, Dr. Mario fills the retro puzzle itch we all get from time to time. It's also one of the best selling NES games of all time, making it worthy of inclusion in the collection. Excite Bike is okay. It can be fun sometimes, but it's too repetitive for my liking. Visuals don't really change, and the gameplay doesn't really change either. Overall, I don't think Excite Bike has much to offer for the modern gamer, but it is recognizable for a lot of people, so I'll give it a pass, I guess. Ghosts and Goblins is difficult. Real difficult. 
I couldn't make it past the first stage. This game is another one that gets a mighty eh from me. It may be cool for some to see it on the service, but for me personally, it's not a game I see myself picking back up anytime soon. Gradius should be here. I'm not too big on 2D shooters, but Gradius is a fun one and is probably one of the better ones on the NES. It just feels a bit generic by today's standards, but I'm sure it didn't feel that way in 1986 when it was released. My only issue is that touching anything kills you, a la Silver Surfer, also on the NES. However, Gradius is leagues ahead of Silver Surfer, so that's good. Ice Climber is pretty jank. Not only do the controls barely work, but the game is super simplistic and, honestly, kind of boring. I get that the Ice Climbers are in Smash and everything, but come on. This game isn't good, and it doesn't demand a spot in this list like some other games do. Ice Hockey is a fun title. You can pick between three different types of players for your team, and you can even play as the USSR. That aged well. The game is okay, but I can't quite get around the early NES vibes coming off this bad boy. It's fun at points, but struggles at others. Overall, a decent enough inclusion. We're halfway done with the original NES online library. There have been some decent titles here and there, but nothing really hard-hitting to get people to buy Nintendo Switch Online. That is until you get to The Legend of Zelda. I've talked about Zelda before, so I won't talk about it for too long. It's an absolute gem of a game and spawned a multi-million dollar video game franchise. Of course this had to be here on the service. It's The Legend of Zelda, the original. Why wouldn't it be playable? The Mario Bros. Arcade port is an inclusion I do not agree with. It's too simple, and I didn't have that much fun playing it. It feels very early arcade-y, but not in a good way. Plus, who wants NES Online to play the original Mario Bros? Pro wrestling on the NES is awesome and great and fun. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Starman is the best character, and I've played this game on its original cartridge way too much. Great game. Next. River City Ransom kinda sucks. It's a poor man's Double Dragon. And with Double Dragon as a part of the service, this game has no purpose in being on the list. So why is it here? I have no idea, but what I do know is that I'm not going back to play it in a long while, if at all. Soccer is... Well, it's soccer. It's bad. It's soccer. Why? Play it yourself and you'll see what I mean. It's not very explainable. Players constantly push the ball around and it never seems like one player ever really has control of the ball. It makes it hard to do anything really when possession of the ball keeps flip-flopping like a pancake. Now here we are. Super Mario Bros. This basically had to be a part of NES Online's launch and it certainly was available. I've talked about the game in a head-to-head -head episode so I won't go into detail but know that the best-selling game on the console needs a spot in the collection. They skip Super Mario Bros. 2 and go straight to 3. If you had to include one over the other, I'd definitely say put in Super Mario Bros. 3. It has more widespread appeal and, in my opinion, better gameplay. They did end up including the second iteration in the Super Mario franchise later down the line, but we're only talking about launch titles here. Tecmo Bowl is a bad football game that really shouldn't be playable in the NES Online collection over some other titles. I suppose they just wanted a football game, but I see no reason to put this one here, seeing as it barely functions. It may just be me being stupid, but I couldn't figure out how to pass, and getting tackled was basically all I really did during my time playing Tech Mobile. Tennis is also pretty simplistic and bad. At least it's better than Quattro Sports Tennis? Finally, we have Yoshi. It's a weird puzzle game that I couldn't figure out entirely. I'm pretty sure you just have to make eggs, but with what creatures inside, I do not know. This isn't really the game I think of when I hear NES, as it came out later in the console's lifespan and didn't see much in terms of lasting impact. So what do I think of the NES Online Library? Well, I think it's alright. Some games are shoo-ins, and others make no sense at all. The over-reliance on subpar sports didn't leave a good impression on me, but overall it's okay for getting started. Nintendo is adding new games to the service every month, constantly providing incentive to come back to the application. Games like Zelda 2, Metroid, and Kirby's Adventure will all be added after the launch of Nintendo Switch Online. Honestly, I don't really think NSO is all that bad, I mean... Oh. So that's what a large-scale riot sounds like. Hey guys, thanks for watching until the end of the video. If you'd like to see more, I've got more to show you. Sonic Colors and Pokemon Detective Pikachu. I'll see you soon in the next video. Bye! Hey guys, it's Game James, and I really like fighting games. They're my favorite genre of game to play, and I just really love the competitive nature of most of them.
But what if we took a fighting game and made it about crabs? Fight Crab is the weirdest fighting game I have ever played. It was released on Early Access not too long ago, so do note that the footage you're seeing is not final. The game is about pitting giant crabs against each other with deadly weapons, mind you, and seeing which one can flip each other on its back first. It's a really strange concept. So, let's see how fun fighting crustaceans can actually be. Fight Crab is an odd piece of software. I'm sure you knew that already, but I feel I have to emphasize it. Nothing is taken seriously in Fight Crab. It's all basically just for funsies. Firstly, let's discuss how you play Fight Crab. You can attack, barely dodge, block, and perform an action called a snip. The first three should be pretty self-explanatory, but a snip is the basic equivalent to a grab in this game. It does less damage than a normal attack, but can go through shields. Hyper Mode is another feature in Fight Crab. Consider it similar to the Smash Meter in Smash Ultimate. Fill it up and you'll be able to buff up your crab for your short period of time. I find it pretty unnecessary, so thankfully there is an option to turn it off in the versus settings. There are weapons in Fight Crab as well. Each crab can hold up to two weapons at a time, one in each claw. Weapons range from swords to shurikens to guns to jet engines. Each weapon has different effects and some cost more than others. Speaking of costs and weapons, let's touch on the campaign mode in this game. And yes, there is a campaign mode in the game about brawling sea life with hammers. The campaign right now is pretty short. There are only a few stages, and each stage can last anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes. Stages play out in rounds. Fight a crab or two, defeat them, and move on. The final bosses can be really tough, as can some of the later rounds. Stages take place in different locations. One carries out in a city with cars and palm trees to pick up, and another is in a medieval dining room. Safe to say, your crab combat techniques can vary depending on where your match is taking place. Before and after fights, you can upgrade your crab by buying them weapons and upgrading their stats with in-game currency earned in the campaign stages. You start with a lowly snow crab without anything, but through upgrades, they can become the most powerful crab in the universe! Did... did I really just say that? The campaign is enjoyable, but as with most fighting games, I'm sure it's the versus mode you're interested in. It does not disappoint. You can pick any crab in the game and with any weapons you choose. I like the blue crab most. He just fits my style. So you might be asking me, but James, with all this praise, is there anything bad to say about Fight Crab? Well, yeah. The gameplay can become very button mash heavy at times, just spamming the attack button. It makes fights less enjoyable as a result. The game can also feel slow at times as well, because sometimes it takes a while for anything to really happen. There is an online mode, but unfortunately I couldn't try this out, as I couldn't get any matches online. I can't fault the developers of Fight Crab for this, but it's something to keep in mind if you plan on snatching a digital copy of this game. The game is available right now for early access for $15. The price is a little steep in my opinion, but with the promise of future content, I don't think it'll be angering too many people. Overall, Fight Crab is a fun little venture that succeeds at what it wants to do. If you're looking for a tough, hard as nails, super competitive fighting game, look elsewhere. But if you're looking for some fun crustacean action, then this is the place you want to be. Now that that's out of the way, I think it's time to initiate Crab Gang! Hey guys, it's Game Games, and thanks for bearing with me as we took a look at Fight Crab. If you'd like to see some of my other content, look no further than the almighty Game James playlist in the description. If you like the look of Fight Crab, the link to buy and download that is also in the description. Thanks again, and I'll see you soon. Bye.